Good morning, Calvary Nexus. It's so good to be with you. As Pastor Jeremy said, I'm Chris. I'm our family pastor here, and I have the privilege and the honor of going through the Word with you this morning. So if you do have your Bible or your phone with the Bible app, can you turn or tap with me to Matthew chapter 6? We're going to be looking at verses 25 through 33, Lord willing. So last week, we wrapped up a three-part series through the Minor Prophet book of Habakkuk, looking at this idea of living by faith. And as we end that series, we begin another three-week series, as Austin was alluding to during worship, called Seek First the Kingdom. And so this series is going to take us through the month of December, and it's going to develop this idea of stewardship. Each one of us has some specific combination of resources in the form of time, talents, and treasures. And each one of us, that combination looks slightly different. None of us know the number of our days. We don't know how much time we have. Um, We each have a unique set of gifts and skills, and each of us has various possessions, and finances look different for each one of us. And so as we consider all this that we have, it begs the question, how can we best use these resources? And it's how we answer this question that develops the idea of stewardship. In its most basic sense, stewardship is simply how you manage what's in your possession. And for us, as followers of Jesus in the context of the church, the desire should be to manage our resources in such a way that glorifies God. And yet, I recognize that for some of us, many of us, most of us, maybe all of us, there is this very real tension between our desire to use all that we have to glorify God while faced with very real, ever-present daily needs that we need met. Paying for rent, mortgage, bills, food, family. And all of a sudden, our needs begin to pile up. And if we're not careful very quickly, associated with those needs, we can grow in worry. Worry about whether or not our resources are going to be able to cover everything that we have before us, everything that's on our plates. And I'm especially reminded of this during the holiday season, right? As joyous as it is, it comes with a lot of complexities, trying to balance home life and work, serving, wanting to manage my expenses well, covering the cost of living, while still wanting to be generous with family and friends. And my guess is all of us can agree that if life is anything, it's rarely simple. There's so many complexities that are before us. And as we start this series, I just want us to really take a moment to consider what needs we have that might be starting to give us some worry. What do we have going on right now? Really think about that. It's got you worrying. Maybe it even comes in some relatively good places. I know for me, uh, one of the places that if I'm not careful with, I can grow in worry is the idea of a growing family. I'm married. I have two kids now. Uh, My kids are growing really fast, and this is a wonderful thing. It is some of the greatest blessings of my life are my wonderful wife and my two children. And yet, with each addition to the family, there are additional needs and resources start to go faster. When I was younger, I I had experience extra income that I could spend on myself. Now that goes to diapers, right? And these little toys that go bing, 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 and you're like, ah. And if I'm not careful, I can worry about these things. And it's that exact worry that we all have that Jesus wants to remove from our lives. And so as we look at his words this morning, we're going to discover how each of us can overcome our worry by renewing our perspectives and setting our eyes on God so that we can find a sense of peace over our resources and we can begin to use them for his glory. And so read with me Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 25. We're just going to start with the two, first two verses this morning. It says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that we get to gather here, that we get to worship you, 
We get to celebrate the season together of you entering into creation in humility as you bring peace, as you bring restoration. Lord, help us to focus on you and your glory throughout our lives. We thank you and we praise you. And it's for your beautiful name we pray. Amen. So our subject this morning and for the next couple weeks is going to be this idea of managing God's resources. Managing God's resources, this idea of stewardship. And the object that I believe God has for us this morning is that we would experience peace and live for God. Experience peace and live for God. So to give us some context to our passage this morning, in Matthew chapter 6, we're smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus would use this teaching on several different occasions throughout his ministry, and at its core, it was developing this idea of what it looked like to be a citizen of his kingdom rather than a citizen of this world. There were many who began to follow Jesus in interest over his miracles, the marvels, the wonders, and yet he wanted them to understand what it truly looked like to follow him, what the call of being a kingdom citizen really was. And amongst various ideas, in Matthew chapter 6, he takes a little bit of extra time to delve a little bit deeper into this idea of resources, money, treasures, and he goes into our attitudes that are often associated with them and the roles that they play in our life. And here specifically, he he goes into this attitude of worry over our resources. And so this morning, we're going to pull three lessons to help us experience peace and begin to live for God. And the first lesson that we learn is to remember our value. To remember our value. In these first two verses, Jesus gives us this command that hopefully brings us a sense of comfort. He says, do not worry about your life. Do not worry about your life. And yet, if, if I'm speaking personally, when I'm worried... If I'm sitting down, sharing my heart with somebody, and their response is, don't worry. I'm like, oh, thanks. I'm like, that changed it. And so when we lift up our, our worries to God, and we hear this response, the first like, feeling might be, well, thanks, God. It didn't really change anything. But I think it helps us to understand what Jesus' point is if we understand how the people in the crowd would have heard his words that morning. And he says, do not worry about your life. This word worry in the Greek translates literally to draw in different directions or to tear apart. And so I believe that Jesus wasn't only giving this command as a sense of assurance, but in a very real way, he was giving the people a warning about what happens when we allow worry to creep into our lives. He says, do not let yourself fall apart over concern of your life. When we worry, we begin to unravel. We begin to unwind. Our attention is pulled in a hundred different directions. And so he's encouraging the people, hey, when you worry, you pull yourself apart. And I would imagine that most of us, if not all of us, can sympathize with this feeling that when we're worrying, we just feel like we're being torn in two. And we, we want to be enough, but we don't feel like we are. We hope that our resources can cover everything, but it's not looking so good. And Jesus explains why we feel this sense of falling apart when we worry. He says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? It's not life more than food in the body, more than clothing. See, worrying is this wrestling of our eternal souls with a concern over temporary things. At our innermost being, we are souls that long to be with the perfect presence of God forever where we can trust in his provision, where we know all things are good. This was the garden where everything was good, where God provided for his people, where they got to walk with him and enjoy his splendor. And then we lost that. And our souls long for that sense of security. And worry is a result of us looking at the world to find that security again. Worry is a result of us finding value in the things of this kingdom rather than God's kingdom. 
And it's at this point that Jesus wants to reframe the people's perspective and our perspective. And he does this by reminding them of the value that they have in God. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And are you not of more value than they? Jesus wants us to remember the value that we have in him. And to do this, I believe, it begins with drawing near to the presence of God. Another way that this word worry can be translated in the Greek is a part as opposed to the whole. A part as opposed to the whole. When we worry... We're not just tearing ourselves apart, but we're isolating ourselves. We look inward. We look at our situations. I know for me, when I get worried, I get like extreme tunnel vision. And nothing seems to matter more than me and my needs that are set before me. And so I just start trying to figure out what's wrong and how I'm going to fix it. And what we do is we lose sight of God and we lose sight of the big picture. We forget that he's working, that he is sovereign. And so if our worry draws our attention away from God, if it makes us feel apart as opposed to the whole picture with the Lord, then the best thing that we can do for ourselves is to draw near to him in these moments. Maybe this is your time in the word, just really meditating on the word of God, growing in understanding of who he is, being reminded of his promises, seeing his faithfulness, understanding his will and his plan for us. This comes by drawing near in times of prayer, Right? Not those like right before a meal, really quick prayers where you're not really even sure what was said. God, God, let us in for food. Amen. Let's eat. And you're like, what? No, like this real intense, dedicated, devoted time in prayer where you're just sitting there talking to God and you're comfortable with the silence and you're just allowing yourself to hear his voice. Maybe it comes through times of fellowship where we're seeing the love of Christ in others and it reminds us of his love for us. But rather than worry, Jesus wants us to draw near to him. And I want us to cling fast to the promise that James gives us in James 4, 8. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Trust in that promise. And your worry, draw near to him. And he will draw near to you. And as you spend time in his presence, the ultimate goal is to remember God's heart for you so that you can be assured of your value in him. Because when we forget our value in God, we turn towards other things, our time, our talents, and our treasures. And we use these things to, to find some sort of sense of value. But that way of thinking is a disassociation from who we are in God. And if we put our value in those things, we have to recognize that those things aren't going to last. This world is wasting away. And if we put our value in those things, our value will waste away. We have to put our value in something eternal, something better, in the Lord and our identity that we get from him. I most struggled with this idea for years of finding my value in finances specifically. Um, I, I don't know why, if it was upbringing, it was competition with my siblings to see who had a bigger bank account, right? But, but in my brain, the more money I had, the more security I had, and the better I was at life. And I remember the peak of this came uh, in late high school as I listened to all my friends talk about colleges and careers and where they were headed next. I had no idea if I even wanted to go to school, and if I did, it wasn't going to be anything crazy. I had no idea what I would major in. I had no idea what career path I wanted to take, and I just felt generally unsure about life. And so I, I went for a walk around my, my childhood home uh, neighborhood, 
And I began to pray to God, and I was just asking him for wisdom. I was asking him for direction. And then, specifically, I remember at some point, my brain jumped to just like explicitly asking God for money, because right? I felt like as my worry grew, that was what was going to fix it. And so I said, Lord, if you could just give me money as an assurance of my value, like that would be great. And I kid you not, I'm not fabricating any part of this story. I turn a corner on my walk, and I feel this sense of, hey, look down. And I was like, oh, Lord, is this it? And so I look down, and I see this Ziploc bag in the gutter, just covered in muck and mire. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you, you are so good, God. And so I lean down, I get my hand all dirty, I pull out this bag. And it is jam-packed with bills, just like full of money. But the important part of the story is that it was full of Monopoly money. Like, no joke. Yellow, green, blue. And I did exactly what you guys just did. I just began to laugh. And I remember the Lord reminding me that money was just going to bring me a momentary sense of value. But it wasn't going to take away my worry. I needed to find my value in Him. And so when we begin to sense that worry, draw close to God. Find his peace that surpasses understanding. Find the comfort of his promises, the assurance of the spirit and the fullness of his love. And when we begin to get in that mindset, we're reminded that our times, talents, and treasures don't provide us value. Value comes from God. And so we can be freed up to begin to use those for God's glory as good stewards. And so this is the first idea is remember our value. The second idea that we want to look at this morning is to let faith drive out fear. Let faith drive out fear. Continuing on in our passage, verse 27, it says, Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. And now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And so he goes on in this sermon by asking this rhetorical question. He says, which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? And a cubit typically referred to a unit of measurement about 18 inches from elbow to fingertip. Uh, but it could also be used in this instance to, to describe the adding on to one's life. But in either case, whether Jesus was referring to adding on of stature or adding on to one's life, the, the point is very clear. He's asking this absurd question that has a very obvious answer. And especially when you put it in the context of our idea of worry, it becomes even clear that he's trying to make this like ridiculous. He says, which of you, by pulling yourselves in different directions, by tearing yourself apart, could possibly build yourself up? Which of you, by worrying, can add to your life? And the answer is, none of us. None of us can add anything of value to our lives by worrying. Because it may seem that way. Right? Like if we need that sense of worry to really kick us into gear, but even when our circumstances take a turn from the worst, worry doesn't really change them for the better. And in my experience, worry often feels like a fight or flight response. Right? Sometimes I get the sense of worry and it's just like deer in the headlights where you're like, oh no, what am I going to do? I forgot about that bill and I don't have money in my checking account today. Right? And you just like freeze and you just are locked up. But there's other days where worry gives me this sense of like Hail Mary response, where it's just like, oh, we got an issue, let's just start throwing problems or throwing solutions at the problem, let's see if we can fix it. And in most cases, it doesn't make anything better, right? It, it leaves me in the same place that I was before, except for now, I'm just feeling beaten. And especially, especially during COVID, I know that these moments have crept into my life a lot more. The sense of, of worry causing me to either lock up or begin to try to take things into my own hands. At the beginning of the pandemic, what we all thought was going to be two weeks ended up being a lot longer. And before the pandemic, we had one kid between my wife and I, and we had two jobs. I had one, she had one. And as 
seems like the world closed. Unfortunately, so did her place of work. And the school was very gracious where she taught, and she did her best to continue on, but at the end of the day, she had to step out. And without warning, our household went from two incomes to one income. And I had to begin to process what this meant for us, what this meant for everyday living. And I'm sure the state of the world did not help anybody's sense of peace, right? You went outside and it was like a ghost town. And it felt like you were in this post-apocalyptic film as masks were coming on as you stepped out of your car. And you're standing in the grocery store and shelves are just like cleared. And you're like, what are we doing? Is everything going to be okay? And if I'm being honest with you, there were some days where I'd be standing in the grocery store with what, what we needed, and I'd go, you know what? Maybe I do need 14 boxes of pasta and 18 cans of beans, right? <laughs> but if you know my daughter's love of pasta and my wife's love of beans, that would have lasted us about a week anyways. But the point is that despite all of my worry throughout this, it didn't change our circumstances. It wasn't going to end the pandemic. It wasn't going to get us more money. It was what it was, and worry wasn't going to change that. And so Jesus uses this illustration to remind us of the fruitlessness of worry. You're not going to add a cubit to your stature through worry. And in verse 30, Jesus tells us that this type of worry is not an issue of resources, but it's ultimately an issue of faith. He calls the people out, and he says, why do you worry? Oh, you have little faith. It's an issue of questioning God's provision. It's an issue of questioning whether he's going to be faithful. One of my favorite examples of this type of fear it comes from the book of Exodus. We, we find in the beginning of Exodus that after Joseph has died, the positive relationship between Israel and Egypt has been forgotten. And the people of Israel are prospering in numbers, and it causes the Egyptian leadership to get a little bit worried. They're like, what if they overthrow us? I got a great idea. Let's enslave them. And so they start to drive them harder. They start to pull away their rights, and they enslave the people of Israel. And their slavery is brutal. And we read in Exodus 2.23 of the result of this. It says, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. And then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. And so God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Isaac, Abraham, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. He heard his people's cry, and so he enacts his plan to free them. He raises up Moses as a leader to go before Pharaoh to say, let God's people go. And despite rejection, he has him go back and back and back until finally Pharaoh relents and he says, get out of my presence. And so they leave and then Pharaoh changes his mind because he realizes what he's just done. He's just let all of his slave labor go. And so he sends out his chariots, his horses, and his men to go and stop the people of Israel from escaping and yet God shows his faithfulness again. He parts the Red Sea, the people walk through, and then he closes it on the Egyptians. People have freedom, and he begins to lead them to the promised land, this land flowing with milk and honey, the land that he has always wanted his people to prosper in. God is so faithful with Israel. And then if we jump to Exodus 16, we find the people of Israel about a month after their journey has begun, a month after and it says, Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And they begin to complain. And they're not light complaints. Like, oh, you know, we're a little hungry. And it's not looking so good. What are, we, what are we gonna do? Like, they're just going straight for the gizzard. They're just like, what are you doing? You brought us out here to die. It would have been better that we stayed in Egypt where we had pots full of meat. We ate bread to the fullest. 
We would have rather died there than out here. Why did you lead us out here? And what they had done was they were allowing their fear to drive out their faith. They had forgotten just how faithful God was to free them, how faithful he was to lead them to this moment. And it's likely that they weren't actually starving at this point. It's likely that they were running low on supplies that they had brought from Egypt, and they were anticipating starvation rather than actually experiencing it. And so their fear consumed them in this moment. And they forgot the Lord's hand over them. And maybe not to that extent, but I know that in the midst of worry, there are moments where our faith can waver. And so Jesus encourages us in our faith. Verse 28 through 30. He says, so why do you worry about clothing? He says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown out into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And he gives them this tangible example of God's faithfulness. He points them to look at creation. And what a wonderful example for them at this time, right? They were outside. And so he pulls this immediate example. Look at the birds. Look at the lilies of the field. But I love this example for us just as much because when I oftentimes consider God's faithfulness when I'm struggling, it's in the context of he was faithful back then, and so you should trust that he's going to be faithful. And that is good, that we have testimony to remember God's faithfulness, to hold to, to look forward to his faithfulness. But this helps us in those moments where we question because of our fear. Yes, Lord, I know you were faithful, but what if this is the time that he's not? What if this is the time where things just aren't going to work out? And to that, Jesus encourages us to be reminded of God's present faithfulness, that in this immediate moment, God's faithfulness is shown throughout creation. He says, look at the birds. Matthew 10, he says they're sold two for a penny, right? They're a dime a dozen, and they find food to eat. It's the grass of the field, which is going to be thrown into the oven. It's going to burn away. He says they're clothed in flowers that would have made Solomon, in all of his splendor as king, pale in comparison. He says as you look out at God's faithfulness throughout creation, how will he not be faithful with you? Creation that was made in his likeness. Creation that he looked at and said, that's very good. Creation that he deeply, deeply loves. I love this example of God's faithfulness. And I would encourage all of us, through every season, to take moments throughout our day to look around us and just find those glimpses of glory, right? Just those little parts of creation where God is reminding you of his faithfulness. I was reminded to do this more often about a year ago in the midst of COVID and we were all isolated at home and as an extrovert, that's like the worst feeling in the world. And so we had um, Pastor Jeremy and his family come over. We were going to go for a casual walk around our neighborhood and so the girls could hang out. We were pushing the joggers. They'd run a little bit, jump back in. And uh, our house is uh, in Cameron Springs, right at the base of the grade. And as we were walking, it was getting later in the day, and the sun began to set. And I, I remember Pastor Jeremy just remarking about how beautiful the mountains were. Just the, the sun coming over them was just gorgeous. And I felt a little convicted because this is literally like my backyard. This is our backyard, and I take it for granted. Like, I don't even think about the mountains like nine out of ten times. But this is the view that I see every day on my drive home. Days where I probably was in my car, exhausted. Days where I was just praying, Lord, I'm not in the mood. Help me to be a good husband. Help me to be a good father. Days where I was anxious. Days where I was angry. And days where I was worried. And each day before me, there was this reminder of God's faithfulness. Reminder that God was faithful to cause the sun to rise and cause the sun to set. 
Reminders that if, if God was so willing to clothe the mountains in such beautiful arrays of light, how would he not provide for me? And so we recognize that this issue of worry comes down to an issue of faith. And so look at creation and see God's faithfulness throughout it. It all belongs to him. And when we recognize that we and everything that we have, our times, talents, and treasures belong to God and not to us, it frees us up to live by faith, to remember his faithfulness, to drive out fear, and to live for him. And so Jesus establishes these two points of remembering our value and allowing faith to drive out fear. And the last idea that we're going to look at this morning is this idea of seeking first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom. Verse 31 through 33, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things, after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Amen. And so one final time in our passage, Jesus gives us this command. So do not worry. But this time, it's with an understanding of why. It's not a half-hearted encouragement. It's a complete assurance. Do not worry because you remind yourself of your value in God, not in the things of this world. Because God has been faithful with us, and so we can take faith in him and allow that to drive out our fear. And then we're cued into this idea that when we're freed from living in worry, we're also freed to live for something greater. And he tells us what that is, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so to answer that question, how can I best use my resources as a good steward, we find that answer here by seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that all other needs will be added unto us. And so what does it look like to seek first the kingdom? At its very core, seeking first the kingdom means that we prioritize life with God over life in this world. Jesus acknowledged that all of us, believer and non-believer, Gentile in the text, believer and non-believer, we have earthly needs. And it's not shameful to have needs. It's not shameful to admit that to others, and it's not shameful to acknowledge when we're struggling to meet those needs. Right? God assures us that he wants to care for us, and he's given us a community that is called to support one another and tangibly care for one another by bearing each other's burdens. And so it's not shameful to have needs or to meet those needs. The point that Jesus is trying to drive home is that the person who does not have the Lord will seek after these needs. In other words, their time, their talents, and their treasures become their God. And this is their priority, is life in this world. And so the ways that they think, the decisions that they make, are motivated and driven by this desire for more in this world. But for the believer who knows their value in the Lord, for the believer who has faith in a faithful God, doesn't need to seek the things of the kingdom of this world. Instead, they can seek a greater kingdom, the kingdom of God. And I love how the author of Hebrews describes this kingdom. In Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. When we prioritize life in this world, we're prioritizing our lives in something that can be shaken. And any kingdom for ourselves that we try to build, it's going to collapse. We need to invest in the kingdom which cannot be shaken. And we do that by prioritizing our life with God. I just want to talk really briefly about two ways that we can begin to prioritize life with God. The first is we can prioritize life with God by giving him our first fruits. By giving him our first fruits. So whether it's our time, our talents, or our treasures, God deserves the best. Right? We should never treat God, his kingdom, or our relationship with him like an afterthought or a second thought. But for each of us, giving him our first fruits, giving him our best, might look a little bit different. 
I'll give you an example of this with the first fruits of time. Uh, my wife loves late nights. It's just how she's wired. You will not find her up before 9 o'clock if she doesn't have to be, but you can definitely find her up through like the middle of the night, right? The other night, I, it was about 10.30, I think. I don't think that's super early. I was like, I'm pretty tired. I'm going to go up to bed. And she goes, okay, do you mind if I stay down here a little bit longer? I'm like, no, it's cool. She's like, just a couple minutes. I just need to unwind. I was like, cool. She comes up at like 1.30 in the morning. And I'm like, what are you doing to yourself, girl? I'm the complete opposite. I love the morning. Uh, you can often find me waking up with the sun singing songs. And my wife's like, get out of our room right now. And I'm like, fair enough. I'll see you later. Right? It's just when I'm most excited. It's when I'm most focused. And so for us, we recognize that Amanda's best time is those evening hours. And that's where you can often find her spending copious amounts of time in the Word and praying and we'll be talking about the scriptures. She'll ask a question, I'll ask a question, and that's just a really good time for her. If she were to try to do that, like at the crack of dawn, it wouldn't be very fruitful for her, as fruitful as it is in the evening. For me, though, those late nights aren't my best. That's not my first fruit. I love that early morning time with the Lord, just with a nice warm cup of coffee, right? And I'm sitting out on my front porch and just enjoying the fresh air. And so we recognize that to give God our best, we give him our first fruits like that. And so for each of us, I want to encourage us to consider the first fruits of our times, talents, and our treasures, how we can be giving God the best. Another way that we can prioritize life with God is by seeking to be more like him. We can prioritize life with God by seeking to be more like him. See, life with God is connected to this idea of being a kingdom citizen, And so I love the way that the Apostle Paul describes this kingdom and our citizenship in Colossians. Chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. I'm going to read them all. Paul says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Listen to this. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of his sins. And so as kingdom citizens, there should be this desire to be made more like our king. As followers of Jesus, we want to look more and more like him as we grow in spiritual wisdom and understanding of his will so that we can walk worthy of the Lord, so that we can be fully pleasing to him, fruitful in every good work. As we prioritize our our life with God, it should transform our hearts, our minds, and the works of our hands, and that will portray itself through the way that we use our times, our talents, and our treasures. And so as we consider this idea of being stewards of all that God has entrusted us, I want to encourage us to remember our value in the Lord. He alone can give you this identity that surpasses our circumstances. Our value is not found in what we have. And so whether we've been entrusted with a little or with a lot, God's heart for you is the same. And as you look at that faithfulness that he has over us. Let it drive you to faith in him as that faith drives out fear. God cares deeply for us and for our needs. And so we don't need to live for the kingdom of this world, but we can seek first his kingdom as good, faithful stewards and as followers of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we're going to transition into a time of communion together. And I love First Sundays as we get to partake. I'm going to ask the ushers to begin to hand out the elements and the worship team to come up. And as we consider communion in the context of being good stewards, as we think about what it means to give back to God, I want us to take a moment to allow the idea of his greatest gift that he's given to us to really sink in. God has given us his only son, 
his beloved son. Everything that we do stems from this reality. Each of us have had moments where we've looked to the kingdom of this world. Each of us has fallen short. None of us are deserving of that presence of God in our life. And he has been faithful to assure us of a way to his heart. That's through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross as he bled and died for our sins. And that's what we do when we take communion. Simply remembering this wonderful gift. And so I want us to take a moment to, cons- to just reflect, to pray, to ask God to set our focus on him, to remember our value, to see his faithfulness, to understand how he's calling us to live for his kingdom. So let's just take a moment together. Lord, settle our hearts on you. Lord, help us to find peace in you. Help us to not worry, to not pull ourselves apart, but to find wholeness in you, to find rest in you, to find comfort in you, to find confidence in you. Lord, and to simply find you. Lord, thank you for this beautiful relationship that you've offered to each one of us. Lord, help us to live as kingdom citizens for your glory. Let's partake of the cracker first in remembrance of his body that was broken. And the Jew second in remembrance of his blood that was shed. Let's worship together.